guess we'll use the mics. Yeah. Are these on? We're good. How's it going, everybody? Doing good? How's the pizza? Shorties? Good. Is mine working? Oh, great. Hi. Well, thanks for coming out. Um, we are honored to be here and see everybody and just to be doing this together and be, being able to share our story and talk about, um, you know, even think, of, think through all the things that have happened in the last six, seven years since we kind of began this journey is really uh, amazing and fun. And it's good to stop and think back and remember all those things. And so we'll do our best to kind of share where we started and the path that led us to this point. And it is very much a non-traditional route. So um, yeah, I'll start with kind of where we're, we are today. Um, we have common grounds and heritage. And um, Kimberly's working on a bookshop concept called Fabled uh, Bookshop. And uh, she'll talk about that in a minute. We also have, I'm opening a restaurant called Milo All Day with a, with a chef who's my business partner over in, uh, on 11th and Franklin. So it's across from Balcones Distillery. It's going to be amazing. They're over there right now pouring concrete and putting up walls and doing all that stuff. So that's probably uh, May or June. We'll be ready to go with that. And then fall when you guys come back, if you do come back, we'll be uh, up and running. So that, and then I'm opening a Common Grounds expansion in Woodway. And in that building, we'll have a pizza restaurant called Westside Pizza Company. And we have a food truck behind Heritage right now selling pizza. So keep getting shorties, because we love shorties. But if you want to try some other pizza that's really good, um, try Westside. That's a little plug, you know, with the students. Uh, and we're really excited about Westside. So that's what we got going today. Did I miss anything? Oh, I also own Cotown Crepes. If you've had a crepe at Magnolia or at the farmer's market, um, that's me and a couple guys that I partner with. A lot of things that we're doing, and I'll talk about just our passion for that in a minute. But And we have a 19-month-old little girl who's the best. Yes. So She's Which isn't a good. business. No, but I'm just saying. Yeah. That's, it takes that's up time. That's really what we have going on. Yeah. Um, so we're both from Waco. Grew up in Waco, and I went to Lorena High School. Kim really went to Midway. And we actually did not meet until, we both went to Baylor. Didn't meet until after she had graduated Baylor at Common Grounds. So we, I was working there at the time. It was in 2007. And we were doing a renovation at the shop. And she came in and brought a bunch of Sonic drinks, and that's where we met. We were friends for good, good friends for five years-ish. Like the type where I'm talking to her about the girlfriends that I have going on, and she's talking to me about guys she's interested in, and we're just like so good friends. be careful friends. if you have those friendships now. You yeah, just you never, never know. know. You never know what can happen. So uh, we ended up getting married in uh, 2013 going on five years so that's us um, from Waco both went to Baylor I uh, started out actually as a business major when it was in business school was at Hankamer um, my dad was an entrepreneur kind of a serial entrepreneur growing up he was always always doing things always had ideas he kind of got into the uh, Christian gift industry and had a business, a couple businesses, and was always like dabbling in different things, and I was never about it. Didn't care, um, was more introspective and kind of a th deep thinker and a little bit removed and didn't really want to engage and talk about business or industry or entrepreneurship or in any way, just wasn't about it. Um, but didn't have any direction really going into Baylor as to what I wanted to major in what I wanted to do. So just kind of as a fallback, just as a given, did business for one semester. I did the intro to business class with a guy named Larry Chonko, who probably no one, someone's shaking their head back there, um, knows of. And instantly, right after that class, went over to the uh, wherever you go, Robinson Tower, and changed my major <laughs> to English because I was not going to continue to do business. It was not for me. It was those classes that you had to create a business and you present it at the end of the semester. And I just hated it. Hated everything about it. 
didn't like, um, yeah, just wasn't a good fit. So I was pretty certain that business was not for me um, and then ended up switching my major to philosophy and ended up with a BA in philosophy. So I am uh, graduated from Baylor in philosophy. And uh, that's uh, really um, kind of where my story started with Common Grounds because Common Grounds back then was this very uh, grungy is the right word, uh, dirty for sure, eclectic, cigarette butts everywhere, even right in the backyard. It was just this very, it wasn't even the time of the hipster. It was the... It was, it was, you walk up, they have like screamo music going and you're like terrified to order. And you're like, yeah, Can I have but that was the appeal. Mochaccino, I'm sorry, <laughs> thank you. You wanted to be so afraid yeah, for yeah. some reason. Yeah, so it was, yeah. it was very different than it is. Oh, I was now. always afraid. Yeah. Um, and Hopefully it's different. I don't know. Yeah, any, you know, angsty, turtleneck-wearing, long hair kid is going to go to Common Grounds, but no one else is. It was just like that group was there, and there was kind of this little crew that would hang out there, and I didn't, I wasn't in a fraternity. Um, I was part of Common Grounds. I was part of that little culture and uh, a lot of my good friends were there. We all worked there. Um, I really fell in love with that culture, just the community and the space and um, how unique it felt and how, um, yeah, mm -hmm. just like a family. It was, really, it was really good, even though for me, I was not in a great place in life, just trying to discover who I was, what I wanted to do, and I would use the word lost. I was very lost, very um, angsty. Angsty is <laughs> yes, you know what I mean. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'm going to tell you a story, and uh, I'm always a little nervous when I tell this because I don't want to give the impression that I'm condoning any kind of negative behavior at all because I'm not. But this is my story, and it's um, it has truth and authority because it is my story and I would want to share it with you guys. Um, I was working at Common Grounds. I was angsty, long dreadlocks, earrings, everything. Um, and I was just like, didn't know who I was, didn't know where I wanted to go. I was a senior at Baylor, was graduating with a philosophy degree, had no direction in life really. And um, I remember feeling like there was this great potential in my life for something, but I just didn't know what that was. And I, I, the guys that I was working under, my superiors, I remember looking at them being like, man, I could do it so much better than those guys. They don't know what they're talking about. They, they don't do this right, they don't do this right, they're just not good leaders. And my response to that, instead of just submitting and um, waiting my time and being humble, was just to be rebellious. Uh, and so, <laughs> One night, I uh, got a bunch of alcohol, do not condone this in any way, took it up to Common Grounds and proceeded to get very, 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 very drunk while working on shift. Um, I, at the end of the shift, towards the end, was actually so drunk that I was breaking mugs against the wall and throwing muffins against the ice machine in defiance <laughs> to my shift leader who was a bad leader. And I'm looking at him, I remember looking at him saying, you're not gonna do anything. You're not gonna do anything. I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep pushing the line until you do something. Uh, and then what do you think happened to me? Fired. I got fired, that's right. Because that's what happens when you do that at any business, you get fired, hopefully you get fired. Um, so I, so you know, if you know nothing else, it's a testament to, to really God's grace. Um, on my life that I now own the business that I was fired from for doing that, um, which, is really, which is really cool and it keeps me humble. And so I uh, kind of went on a trajectory after that of still discovering who I was, moved around a little bit, I graduated from Baylor, thought about going and getting a PhD in philosophy um, and actually applied to some different universities, nothing ever panned out. And uh, just kind of ended up coming back to Common Grounds. I was in Waco, Waco living with my, with my parents. My dad had just contracted cancer during the time. And so it was a really hard time. I was living with them. 
he was sick, and just as a fallback, because I didn't have anything else, I came back to Common Grounds, talked to the owner at the time, uh, please let me back, I'm not gonna do that again, look, I've cut my hair, I'm a different person, yeah. and they let me back. You, you were a different person, Yeah. going back. Yeah, were you working there at, during that time? Oh, no, funny story about that is, uh, <laughs> You were the manager for a little bit, uh -huh. and then you were leaving, and they were trying to replace Kimberly because she managed it for a minute, and she was on the little committee interviewing, and I interviewed for the manager job, and you didn't give it to me. <laughs> I forgot about that. I was hoping you were going to forget that part. <laughs> you didn't give me the job. No, we'll talk about that later. Um. I ended up just coming back as a barista, so I, was, I just came back, and I, I remember coming back, I was very honored and humbled just to be able to come back, and I was, I was 24, 25, still didn't really know what I was doing, I had a college degree from Baylor University, working part-time job at this coffee shop that I worked at in, in college, and it was not, um, you know, sexy or ideal in any way, it was just what it was. And, but I, I, was very, I was very humble because I was so honored to be back. And I remember just thinking, man, I want to do whatever I can do, if it's seen or not seen, if it's paid for or not, just to give into this place and to help. And I would come up late at night just to help. I, I would give ideas. I would uh, do diagrams of bar flow and systems on my computer and present it at meetings. Just like, hey, what about this? What about this? And, I, and then... Because of that, this favor grew with the owner, and I was, I think it was about a three-month period from coming back to Common Grounds, I was promoted to the GM, which was a really hard process of uh, going from working under your friends, with your friends, to then managing your friends in a place like Common Grounds, um, and began a two-year process of managing Common Grounds. Um, another hard part of that, well, that was when we bought it because we were dating, um, but I uh, managed it for two years and ended up purchasing the business in 2012. Um, and I would I'll just say you know it's really been a crash course in management, leadership, um, culture development, learning how to. I mean I'm a philosophy major, so I'm literally literally reading management for dummies. Uh, and how do I how do I read a P&L sheet or think about so, cash flow? So many calls to the CPA. Um, okay, I'm in QuickBooks. Like, what does this term mean? This is more me, not so much Blake. But you you were there yeah. in a lot of ways too. Like, what are we doing? Yeah, but just just like uh, you know, having to learn um, how to manage and then feeling the weight of ownership, which is an entirely different thing. <laughs> all in itself. I remember being so excited about the prospect of owning this business and thinking like, oh man, this is going to be amazing. I love playing disc golf at Cameron Park. And so when I was managing at Common Grounds, I was, I'd always try to kind of sneak away and go play disc golf, turn off my phone. And I thought, oh man, when I own this place, I'm going to play disc golf all the time because I'm going to have carte blanche freedom. I'm the owner. No, like it just, and I remember I didn't play at all. It was really hard to get away, and it's still that way. It's that weight of the responsibility of, of uh, all these people who work for you who got to get paychecks. It's the responsibility of the bills you got to pay for, the, um, the equipment that breaks, the conflict that comes up. It's so many things that you take. The, when you're the owner, you take on the weight of those things on your shoulders. So learning how to carry that weight has been a journey. I'll let you enter in. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think just to touch on the Common Grounds kind of chapter of our lives, um, you know, us coming together um, and kind of running with this business for the last five years, um, there's been so much grace for us as, again, new business owners at least five years ago because Common Grounds was like a really safe place for us to learn all these things. At least that's how I feel. You know, the business itself was like already really established and well-known and loved and 
integrated into the Baylor community, and so we weren't having to like launch this thing from scratch by ourselves. But it gave us um, a lot of challenges that like a really successful business has versus like a startup um, trying to keep up and that kind of thing. But um, so it has been a safe place, I feel like, to learn. Um, and it's kind of launched us into kind of what we're doing now, which is, which is really exciting and we love. So, but just to kind of tag team, I guess, my story and how I tie in. Um, so um, from Waco uh, was the typical Waco person. Is anyone from Waco in here? Yes. Okay. So maybe you were this way. Maybe you weren't. Where you were like, I'm getting out of Waco in high school. I'm going to go anywhere but Baylor. Where is, yeah, okay. And then you go to Baylor, so. Um, <laughs> I literally so. did the Snap app online for Baylor. It took me five minutes, and I was in. But that was, it was, it was a different it was, time. We won't say how long ago it was, but it was <laughs> quite a while ago. Um, anyway, so um, when I was at Baylor, I was an English major. Was an English major from day one. I knew that's what I wanted to major in. Everyone would always ask, what are you going to do with an English major? And I'd say, I don't know. But I, I just loved it. I loved all of my classes. I was super like passionate. Um, I can remember some of my friends were always like, hum hawing, like, oh, I like, don't want to go to this class or whatever. And I had classes where I like never missed one because, you know, I just like wanted to be there for what the professor was saying. Not every class was that way, but um, so I, um, yeah, finished Baylor, and I worked um, with a youth ministry in town for a long time at First Baptist uh, Woodway, and ended up moving to England, um, and I lived there for two years and did youth work. So I was also a tour guide. I mean, I was just this, like, free spirit, you know, don't want to be tied down, going to go travel and live abroad and that kind of thing. So... Um, funnily enough, ended up coming back to Waco, and Blake and I started dating, and he was kind of in the process at that time of buying Common Grounds, which I had worked at and managed right after college when I was working um, at this, with this youth ministry as well. And so um, during that time, I was like, well, I don't know what I want to do. I love, I still love English, I still love literature, so like maybe I'll apply to go to grad school at Baylor and get like a master's in English, and maybe someday I'll like get my PhD and go teach, you know. Tell them how easy it was to work for me, though, oh, at the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Little rule of or advice. Uh, working <laughs> with your, or dating your boss slash fiance while he's just bought a business and you're both, like, trying to figure yourself out, it was crazy. So, <laughs> little rule of advice. Only, not for everyone, not for everyone, but we, we did it. We made it. Yeah, we get up. Um, <laughs> so I, so right before we got married, I found out from Baylor that I did not get accepted into the grad program. I think it's because in my cover letter, I literally put, I really want to do this program. I don't know if I'm going to teach with it. I might open a bookshop with it someday, but I just feel like it'd be a really good opportunity, which like in the academic world, they're like, no, we want someone who's going to come and do this and then like go and write and be a prolific, you know, um, scholar and make our name great, you know. So I was like, next. Um, so at that point, that was really hard because I didn't have my thing. Um, but I feel like, again, just talking about moments when your tra the trajectory of your life just shifts um, and you see like, wow, God really had his hand in um, just what he was doing. He knew better. And so I just jumped in with Blake and jumped alongside him and really like just was his helpmate in doing Common Grounds in the early days. So, I mean, in the beginning, it was like the two of us and maybe one other manager who helped with the coffee, and that was it. So we were doing, now there's what, like eight, eight full-time jobs doing what Blake and I were doing, like back in those days. So we were a little stressed out. <laughs> Um, early marriage, but um, again, just coming alongside him, learning how to do accounts, learning how to do, you know, staff meetings, operating, I mean, just everything you learn on your feet. Um, I don't know if any of y'all have ever, like, worked or interned with a small business, 
um, or a local, but I mean, you just have to wear a lot of hats. Like you're this person and you're this person and you're this person, and but you learn so much through that. And so, but I can remember during those days, like always thinking, like, but what is what is given? What has been given me to do? Like, I love being a part of this story, but like, is there something that's special, like that God's given me to do um, with what I'm passionate for? And so. Um, so a big part of my heart in all of this has always been to open a bookshop. That's like my dream um, since I was in college. Just always thought that would be so amazing. But I had, again, I literally did not take one business class. I never even, I don't even know if I went into the business school. Like, don't even know. Um, and so I had no idea. So I didn't know what you guys knew. Like, how do you start a business? Like, I had no idea. Um, how do you raise money? How do you, like just do all the myriad of things that you have to do to make it happen. Um, but then I married Blake, and we just have had the opportunity to do some really fun stuff and open Herod's Creamery, which was such an adventure. And we learned, like, trial and error, what to do and what not to do, you know, in the process of working with the city and doing building codes and architect stuff and just... Um, so many things, and so through that, um, all of a sudden this opportunity came up to me, unlooked for. Um, this girl reached out to me and was like, hey, I heard you're interested in opening a bookshop. This is a dream of mine too. I'd love to chat with you about it. And so a year and a half ago, we met up and just kind of thought we'd be like, yay books, we love to read. Wouldn't this be a cool thing to do someday? But the conversation just kept going, and these opportunities just kept happening. We kept connecting with people um, and realized that there is such a excitement and a need in Waco for an independent bookshop um, to help, like, be a staple in the city. And so um, just through that, like, learned really from watching Blake do the whole Milo project and raising investors and... Um, just that whole process, like kind of, okay, what did you do? Okay, so this is, you know, here's our pro forma, here's our business plan, and just did so much work and research. And anyway, so Fabled Bookshop is happening, so awesome. Um, but the, I think to kind of sum up that story, um, sometimes like disappointments, again, open doors to like what is truly the best for you, and um, serving underneath someone, serving someone else's dream, or serving something that might not be like, this is the thing I want to give my life to, is going to be what equips you for the thing that is um, what you're passionate about and what you're going to do. And so um, it's been a really fun story, <laughs> fun journey. Uh, I'm really thankful for... Baylor for the philosophy department and for that time because uh, and, I'll, and I say this to people a lot but it really taught me how to be a learner and how to um, just engage with any, any anything that I'm unfamiliar with or I, I need help with uh, and to also work with people I think that's a big part of any, any business that you do definitely it's it's something that I learned early on what made me fall in love with Common Grounds early on was the culture, was the people. Um, I, w I remember reading a book. I was reading, I think it was the Management for Dummies, but they were talking about the the shoe company Zappos, and is that Zappos, right? Yeah, they uh, have a really amazing culture, and part of that is they've just defined their core values as a company, what it is that they're all about, their mission statement, and they just have. Everything kind of flows through the lens of their core values, who they are, um, and it's defined, and everyone knows it, and everyone lives it. And that's kind of become a model for a lot of uh, larger companies, Google, different, different massive companies, is this culture of people that um, is informed by really clear values and then live that out, and that's part of what makes it so great and what makes it tick and work and translate to the marketplace. Um, and you know we're on much a much smaller scale common grounds is but it always was apparent to me that there was something intangible here that was actually more important 
than the tangible, than the product itself. And that is something that I wanted to hone in on. What are the intangibles that make, that drive this thing? The culture, the values, it's, it, you walk in and you feel it and you can cut it with a knife, it's, it's thick. And there's people that come back after being gone for years, decades even now, that have to come back to their little shop because it was home to some extent for them. And so that's something that we've kind of taken on with the other things that we're doing is, uh, you know, we've fallen in, I've fallen into this passion, if you will, for the hospitality industry uh, in Waco specifically. I think there is a great need for new things happening in this industry in Waco, um, and we want to do that. And there's not like a specific lane. Of, it's not just coffee. It's not just ice ice cream. There's a there's a myriad of things that we could do. Um, and as I've gone forward, I've realized there's a lot of people that are also excited about this. Some of those people we've partnered with. Some of those people we just support from a distance and cheer on thank you for doing that you might be a competitor on paper but we're super stoked that you're doing that that's awesome um and really it's there's something unique when something's done really well and it's excellent from the product to the atmosphere to you know how the employees are trained and the culture the music that's played all those things just having a, con a cohesion of excellence you can, it really creates a really fun experience, and that's not something that's been the case in this city until now. We're, we're, in, a, we're in a new wave of a new, fresh entrepreneurial spirit that's kind of flooding the city, and it's, there's this synergy happening with Magnolia and with Baylor and with downtown development and all this fun stuff that's creating this energy for um, new ideas for young people to stay in Waco to really live out their dream and to do things really well. Um, and I really hope that as it continues that, that that bar of excellence will continue to get higher so that it's not going to be possible to just open up a, a restaurant or a business without an amazing quality and excellent offering across the board. Um, not that we do everything perfect all the time, but that's really what we shoot for. So. That's kind of it. Uh, I would second what Kimberly said about um, submitting and being content with where you are. I, mem I remember sitting, not in your seat, but as a student, just kind of like, you know, what is my gift to give to, to the world or my calling or my role? I had no idea. And I was always restless with that, just constantly restless. And I think there's something really powerful that's unlocked when you can just be where you're at, give yourself to that, be uh, faithful in the small things and where you're at, whatever that is. Because there's, there's no way going back eight years that I would have said we would be here now doing what we do. It's been such a journey. Um, so yeah. that's about it. I, I'll say one more thing too. I'm totally piggybacking on you, but I was thinking about this earlier today um, because you know, I don't know if any of you guys are doing like an internship or volunteering somewhere or you have a job and it may seem like, yeah, I'm kind of interested in this, but, you know, it's really to like, I don't know, fulfill a requirement or something like that. But again, whatever you're learning there is preparing you. So if whatever you can give your time, yourself, your energy to, like, you are going to be trained and taught like tenfold. Um, so we have, you know, these interns like free that come and work at Common Grounds, help with live events, help with social media, and then they they do it for free and as a you know class requirement, and they learn so much. And then they maybe stay on, and we pay them to do it, and they learn so much. And then our last social media girl just got a job for Baylor. She's literally like a, in charge of the social media accounts for Baylor University. So just saying like what seems small now is truly, truly investing like in yourself and also in, in the local community. Um, and so just everything is preparation and don't like if I, I mean, there's things that we do now in marketing and strategy that I literally learned from working with a youth ministry, like in having like weekly 
meetings and brainstorming and strategizing for that ministry. And so, like, don't just brush aside, like, what you're doing right now. It truly is, like, investing into what you're going to do when it's what you really want to do. Uh, first off, thanks for coming. I uh, appreciate y'all uh, sharing your knowledge. Uh, my question is, can you, or my request is maybe you could ex uh, talk about your partnership with other local businesses, uh, like most recently the hat company, I noticed, and uh, some other things I've, uh, I've seen on your shelves. Like, what, what was the process like, and um, was that a mutual thing? Did you seek them out, or did they come to you? Ha uh, how'd that all come about? Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. It it's kind of this organic thing that is different every time. With that specifically, uh, Jed Cole randomly was a friend. He's the guy that started the hat company, uh, Waco Hat Company. He, a mutual friend of ours, told me about him and said, "You need to meet this guy. He's awesome. He's he's at Harvard right now, and he's moving to Waco. So you need to meet him." And we went to lunch, and I met him, and we just started talking. And, you know, he, he was doing hats over at Pinewood, and I, I know those guys that used to work at Common Grounds, and so that's how that happened, kind of just meeting him, and a lot of times it's just relationships, just meeting, meeting people, and, um, you know, Kevin back there facilitates a lot of that um, and helps bring entrepreneurs together, and that's something that's not really been the case in the past, but it's happening more and more where people are sharing ideas and finding that there's a lot of similar lanes they can run together and partner in. So, yeah. I'll just say to you, a lot of it is, you know, seeing your need and then trying to choose a local option. So, like one thing, for example, for Common Grounds is we sell like normal mugs and then we also sell hand thrown mugs, which again, um, have become really popular. Magnolia sells them as well, but you know, five years ago, we were still selling these mugs from a local guy um, named Jonathan Martin who owns Black Oak Art. And like, it's amazing for him and his story that Magnolia's partnered with him and is now, like they have this huge thing, but it's really just like being intentional to choose like, okay, we can do this and let's do something local. You know, so for Westside and Common Grounds Woodway, we've used several local vendors to like create custom furniture because like yeah we could just buy it from cb2 or wayfair or whatever but if we can like integrate you know a local craftsman into that project then that's so fun because then they're like just yours and um, they have a story so i think also it's like a lot of times it's just relationship like meeting people and having a synergy and um but a lot of times it's being intentional to choose that you know, find find that vendor that could be a local, you know, option. So, yeah. Um, he doesn't need that, but whatever. <laughs> so, compared to a lot of other local businesses, your guys' social media digital strategy performs way better. Can you talk a little bit about what you guys do to plan for that, and what do you think the success comes from? And is it organic, or, or do you guys really push PPC and that kind of stuff for that? Is it successful? <laughs> <laughs> you want to? Yeah, I'll answer a little bit. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate yeah. that. It's really awesome. Um, so again, um, we have a director of marketing that does that is kind of the umbrella for a lot of that. Um, but, you know, t backing it up two, three years ago, um, when we first were really like, okay, we've got to hone this in, um, I think we decided that we had to have a consistent look, so same filter, so, you know, we can use one of these three or whatever. This was like, again, two years ago, so it was still like taking it with a iPhone and, um, I think just then starting like, okay, let's create a strategy. like. Let's back it up two weeks out, a month out for the fall. What are some things we can do? Um, and then really just like, I mean, 
when Common Grounds hit 20,000 Instagram followers, it was like, what is happening? Like, this is, we are a coffee shop in Waco. Um, and so I think that they were just really intentional about making it excellent and, and defining the voice. So like every post, like we want it to feel like it's the same person or the same entity like speaking. Um, and so in the same for Heritage, you know, to really like that's a new business. So Common Grounds is like 24 years old. So it, its voice is so strong, um, but Heritage is new. So that's been fun to like, okay, what's what's going to be our take you know um and so even now now it's like we use like a professional camera for all of our pictures like their kind of caliber has escalated more and more and i think that it's it takes a lot more work so i don't know if any of y'all know carly rude but she does all of our pictures um she's like in charge of our social media right now and she's amazing and she works so hard to make everything look excellent and so I think it's just like making it a priority um, and creating, again, like a synergy or something that, okay, what is our voice? Um, and yeah. Yeah, how do we deal with the negative voices that challenged us? Is that is that your question? Um, yeah, that's that's always there. And I think looking back, I mean, the only thing I can say about it is what we've just what we've chosen has been primarily on faith and coming from a core belief system in us that had to have some backing um, in reason and financial awareness and risk assessment. I mean, we had to have that, but really, if it was just that, we wouldn't have done what we did. And that's there's a lot to that conversation. One of those is we don't own the property that we, uh, at Common Grounds and Heritage, and that's been a, a risk. Um, we have, So that's one of those things that we've had to step out in faith and just continue to believe and trust that there is a lot of purpose behind this and there's a reason that we're doing this um, there's been yeah a lot of challenging voices and I think focusing on looking I think looking back on uh, you know what has led me to this point and really focusing on okay this is who I am this is where I'm going um, and choosing it choosing to trust that court belief system whatever that is and for us, that's been faith in God and really trusting that he brought us to this point. So, I mean, yeah, I think it's sometimes I vacillate on we can lose everything to, oh, we're good. This is amazing. The, the path is lit. We're good. To, oh, my God, we, we could just, everything's lost. And, and that's hard because I'm a very emotional person, so some people aren't like that, but it's hard to um, navigate and reconcile yourself to those feelings, those emotions sometimes. Focusing on, okay, this is where I've come from, this is where I'm going, and I can't discount what has happened that led us here. I know there's so many things that we haven't even talked about that we could go back and say, man, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. I would have when I was working for my boss at the time, managing the company, there's five, clearly five times I remember that I was very close to quitting because it was so difficult at the time. So just looking back like, man, any small step one way or the other, I would have been off course, but we kept going forward. And that that is powerful, I think. Yeah, does that help at all? <laughs> Yes, I know your face. So what are your favorite resources, both of you? Your, your favorite resources for professional development, whether it's a podcast that you listen to or a book or you have a business resource? Uh, Waco Business News podcast? Just kidding. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, so for me, it's been, I, I meet with a group of men um, for uh, basically a CEO roundtable um, group, and that, and they're all older and wiser and have been around a lot longer, and that's been really challenging and just so amazing for me to learn and to vet ideas and to talk about really hard things that I'm going through and get feedback and counsel. So I think like just having good counsel with like-minded businessmen who have more years and more experience. I'm not really a podcast guy. I started listening to, uh, what's his name? It's uh, Malcolm Gladwell's podcast. That's amazing. Revisionist history. That's amazing. But not like business stuff. I don't really dial in to a podcast. I think for me, um, I, I am a podcast person. Um, so I've been listening to the Donald Miller Building a Story Brand um, podcast and reading his book right now and kind of going through it once through the lens of Heritage Creamery and then once I'll go through it with the lens of Fabled and, and kind of building that story from the ground up. Um, so uh, I'm really excited about that. Um, and really just like books, reading, I mean, you know, uh, love Dave Ramsey on tree leadership. Um, <laughs> just like you're, I mean, it's probably pretty basic, but again, for us, like, you know, we're just um, trying to, I think I want to be responsible shifting into like being the owner, carrying that weight. I want to be really intentional about um, having a clear goal and a clear, like, just path forward and what are going to be our values and, and all of that. Um, so that when things open and get started, like we're not floundering and trying to figure out who we are at that point. Um, I think for me, I've really felt a lack in like women business mentorship. Um, I've literally like hounded the guy who runs Blake's CEO roundtable. I've been like, you have to start one for women. Like you have to start one for women, which women are actually allowed in the one that they do, but I just feel like there's something that is so unique about being a woman business leader owner um, that really needs like a lot of like covering. And so I've like reached out to people and nothing's panned out. So li literally right now, the best thing for me that's been so encouraging is um, listening to the women on the Happy Hour podcast with Jamie Ivey, which sounds so lame, I know. But because I have this lack right now in like just a dialogue with women who are believers, moms, and business owners, she always has people on there that like run their own company, who are the CEO of their own company, who started this thing and grew it for, you know, in five years down the road. And so hearing their stories while having kids, you know, while being married, that kind of thing. So hearing their stories has been really encouraging and impactful, and I've taken away a lot of. Um, just truth and encouragement. Like, I'm not crazy for thinking that I can do this. Like, people do it, and it works. So, yeah. yeah. Um, with these uh, new business ventures, how do you all go about finding new investors? I know that's loaded, but... <laughs> um, that's, good. that's a good question. We, a lot of times through relationships, again, um, I find that there are a lot of individuals locally that have resources that want to be a part of what's happening right now, but just don't have a, a means to get connected up or to have that conversation. And there's not, there's not like a forum for that currently. I th there is, there, there are things that are happening, but um, you know, I think for us, I'll speak for me and Milo specifically, and then she can speak for Fabled. Um, but it's been a really challenging process and it's really been organic and just really my business partner having these farm to table dinners and people coming and saying, man, this is awesome. Are you opening a restaurant? Yes. Can I give you money? Can I be a part of it? Yes. You can, you can give us money for sure. <laughs> but that's... Corey McIntyre, is my, he's amazing, and he, he's just a savant chef and uh, really knows his stuff. And so that's been our, our process with it. I mean, I, 
my sister was an entrepreneurship major, professional sales here, and so she'll, her and I will talk, and she's like, you don't know what you're doing, do you? No, I don't. Like, well, here's some types of investment that happens and investment models and scenarios. So I, that's something that I had no idea about because we, we own Common Grounds, that business, as a sole proprietor. There's not any other investors. So that's a new thing. Yeah, I think a lot of it is like putting yourself out there. Um, you know, so there are some that just come to you like, oh, I heard you're opening this. Like, I'd love to talk to you about investing. That's great. But a lot of it is like asking people, you know, hey, do you know anyone who would be interested in being a part of this? And so people, you know, I've contacted people from Baylor and, and just who have lots of contacts like, hey, do you know anyone who'd be interested? Yes, I do. Here's a couple I'm going to tell, you know, that I'm going to tell you that you might reach out to them. And then I reach out to them. So a lot of it is like even c contacting people who might not necessarily be your investors, but seeing like, who do you know? Who do you know? Which again, I like moving to a new city and starting to do something like that. I can't imagine how hard that would be because being from Waco like has been so helpful because you, at least for us, like we want to be really confident in who's going to be on that team with us and part of that I mean it really is like a family and so um, just having that ability to know people's backgrounds and just like not necessarily background but you know are, are you going to work well with that person do they have a good standing in the community that kind of thing um, so putting out feelers 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 putting yourself out there you're going to get told sorry this isn't you know the right thing for us like so many times but you know the ones that say yes, it's worth it. Um, yeah. So thanks for coming out today and sharing your story. Appreciate that. I'm always intrigued when I see couples who are working together professionally um, because I, someone once told me, never bring your honey where you make your money. <laughs> um, and Kimberly, you hinted at this a little bit earlier. Um, so I, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. One is, Working together as a couple, how has that encouraged your relationship, your personal relationship? How has it challenged your relationship? And what advice would you give those who may consider kind of uh, working professionally with their uh, significant other? Yeah, I knew that was coming. <laughs> I was, I was going to be embarrassed for all of you if you didn't ask that question. Um, uh, that's been the hardest thing and the best thing. And it's, it's a very good question. Um, there is so much that happens in marriage that you work through at home and when you couple that with doing something together in a professional space you just open up the door for so many more things that you need to work through and how you communicate i remember we had early on um just the just the roles defining okay we're married at home and doing this together and here there's kind of i mean i'm clearly a little more the leader and she's clearly like taking care of everything else on the ground um, and we need both of us but what are our roles and how, how do we submit to one another um, if I have an idea and she has an idea whose idea carries the day um, in the business and you know we've had a lot of conflict in that I think I will say not everyone can do it I've found that just personality differences or whatever core competencies, whatever that looks like. It's not for every couple, but for us, my proclivity and my bend towards big picture, um, vision casting, people development, uh, and thinking about ideas and concepts has really um, married well or meshed well with Kimberly's more detail-oriented, um, working with the atmosphere and the and the accounts and the things that I'm just not going to see. So that's been the learning that and knowing that we couldn't have gotten here, I couldn't have gotten here without her is super encouraging um, because I, I sometimes do this thought project where I think about everything we've done and everything we have and I take Kimberly out of it in my mind. Like just blink, remove her out of it, put her over here and it's just this mess. It's just there's so many things that you wouldn't see that aren't as um, big that have to happen to keep the thing going forward. 
Um, so it's been really encouraging, really hard, and I think it feels like to us we've been married almost five years. It feels like we've been married 15 years because of it. It just expedites because of the amount of conversations, the amount of issues that we're navigating together. Was there something else? Oh. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. Um, uh, marry the right person and and count the cost before going into business together. And that's, I, th I think if not for our commitment to each other and our commitment, to our shared commitment to the business, I think we share a value, then either we would have stopped doing the business or we would have gotten a divorce because of how much it takes. But because we've had shared values to each other and to this little shop that we both love, then it's worked. Um, and then a lot of a lot of humility in there too, probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's not too much to say, but I think, like from my perspective as well, just um, I think the learning. You know, uh, we were dating and then engaged and then married, running this business, and so. Blake had his office, and so I would just like walk in because I'm like, this is my husband. Like, I can go in his office whenever I want because we're married and whatever. And he'd kind of be like, I'm working on something. Like, can you please? And so, I mean, you know, it just took me a while, but but again, just learning like, yeah, can you please just knock? <laughs> um, but learning like, hey, like when we're at work, like he needs, like we need to have that, that, that I need to have that like deference to say like, hey, is this a good time? Whereas at home, it's like, our time is, you know, each other's, but it worked just learning, like, how to respect him and, like, see his needs, like, what he needs from me in that space and also um, vice versa. And so I think when we say it feels like it's been 10 years or 15 years, it's just because we've gone through so much. Like, in five years, we've run a business, opened another one together. He's doing more. I'm doing one more. I mean, we have a kid, and... So it just, there's been so much dialogue, I think, that we've had to work through, like Blake said, more, I feel like we've had to work through what people work through in 10 years of marriage, like in five years, and so. Um, but I do say, I do like echo everything Blake said, that um, it isn't for everyone, but it has been so amazing to work towards the same thing. So like, don't do it unless you literally can both stand side by side and look to the same vision and say like, yes, 100%, this is what we want to spend our lives doing. Like, this is what we want to pour out to see happen. And because we have that same passion to see places like this happen in Waco, then I can come alongside him and support him and vice versa to me. But if we were kind of off on that, then um, it would be pretty possible so yeah having that shared vision is probably the advice or key I think yeah so when you have a new idea or opportunity what are some of the intangibles you should consider when you're making that decision whether or not to jump into it um, when you have a new idea or, or opportunity what are the intangibles that you consider um I think I'm always considering and thinking about just what what is there a space for or a need for. Um, I'm, I'm obviously thinking about would this work? Would, would the marketplace respond to it? Um, yeah, as far as intangibles go, I don't. Can you clarify maybe what you mean by that? Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, that's that's good. That helped me. Um I definitely think that there is a 
conscious slash subconscious thing in me that it has to fit with this this is what we're doing we are about doing these types of businesses in in this industry in this city and so that's that's that yeah that that fault line or that point of reference if I'm thinking about a new venture because this happens all the time with the people that I'm talking with. What if we opened up a men's grooming barber shop that served alcohol and did this? Oh, that sounds awesome. Um, do I have a person that could run that? How are we going to pay for that? And does that really fit in the world that we're doing? Because for me, like, what makes it work for me is I've delegated enough out and I can have enough um, relationship and connection to these managers to keep all the small, the, all the businesses and the spheres going. But the only way that I can do more is if I back out. So delegating is huge and that's, the, that's gonna be my core question. Who's an operator that I see kind of in our world here that can take that on and work with me to the extent that I don't have to physically be present day in and day out because if I do it's not what I'm made for and what I want to be doing and it compromises all these other things we got going on so that's a question that I'll ask first and foremost is is there enough energy and there's a person that can run this thing at least at some point I'll run it from at the beginning but you have to be able to delegate to a day in day out operator does that answer your question okay